Alice Ann is a wife of 36 years, mother of five, grandmother of 10 with one on the way. She joined Toastmasters only three years ago, and she is diligently working on making her name, oops, I can't see the whole thing, making her name synonymous. Sorry, more on my screen. Making her name sy synonymous with Toastmasters. Alison belongs to one club and ser served as VPPR in four. She also served as VPE in two. She has served as the area director of both um, Division B Area 13 and Division B Area 14 in District 103. Allison belongs to clubs in Las Vegas, North Carolina, California, Texas, Ohio, San Francisco, Sydney, Ireland, Kentucky, Australia, Wyoming, Alaska, and six clubs in Chicago. Allison has already completed all 11 paths and is currently working on becoming becoming a better communicator. Since the pandemic, Alisan has attended at least one Toastmasters Club meeting every day. Alisan is working on her second go-round of completing all 11 Pathway Paths. Let me please introduce, give a warm welcome to Alisan. Thank you, thank you so very, very much. And let me begin this presentation with saying, there are 15 million, 778,000 seconds within six months. And there are 262,800 minutes in six months. And there are 4,382.91 days in six months. And there are 182.5, yeah, 182.5 days in six months. What can you do in six months? Within six months was the title of my speech. And I began the speech with all of those figures, breaking down how long six months were. But my speech wasn't about six months. My speech was about what I did in those six months. You see, in January of last year, the doctors told my husband and I that his organs were deteriorating. And at the rate that they were deteriorating, the doctor predicted six months. My husband is still here. So glad their predictions was wrong. I began the story with those numbers to kind of draw my audience in. Where is she going with this? And today's presentation is to teach us how to take even the mundane speeches and create something wonderful because we added a story. If I was just going to give a speech about time, people will probably think that was really boring. But when you added a story to that, people were interested in what you had to say. I began that story with all of those figures about how much time it was in six months. And I can look at people while I was giving the speech, where's she going with that? But when I said my husband was given six months, everybody was what? what? What happened after that? People were really interested in what I had to say. And what I had to say was, time is precious. Whatever loved one that you have, don't waste a second of it. Don't waste a moment of it. Don't waste a minute of it. Don't waste any days of it. Tell your loved one that you love them because basically that was the essence of my speech. And I didn't want to just say, tell your loved one that you love them. I created a story, the true story, but I created a story because that day the doctors told us that I lost it. Not going to lie. I was hysterical. My, I was screaming. I couldn't believe it. And I said, you can't leave me too soon. 36 years is not long enough. You can't leave me. Then my husband wanted to shake me. Stop, babe. Calm down. We're not counting the days. Already, I figured out it was 182.5 days. He knew me. Babe, we're not counting days. We're making days count. 
put on my brave face. Okay. He said, now that you heard the information and the news that the doctors have given us, what is it that you want to do? What do you think I said? Want to go somewhere? Want to travel? No, that's not what I said. Everyone was waiting because I paused at that moment. Hmm. What do I want to do? Then I said, I want to make love to you every single day. He smiled. I said, not like that. But that's not a problem. But I didn't mean it like that. I want to take every opportunity to make you know that I love you. That's going to be my ambition for the next six months or however long we have. I'm going to make sure that you know that you are loved. And in those six months, we created a lot of things. I'm glad the prediction was wrong because he's still here and I get to still enjoy being with my husband. But we learned in those six months to laugh more, to spend more time with one another, to talk to each other. The first thing we did was wrote out the obituary, not just here, but mine too, because we never know. He said one last thing he wanted me to have to worry about. Then we start working on our debt, paying off all our bills. Guess what? We did. Now, at the six-month period, we hadn't worked it all out, but we had gotten it down to at least $400. Now, we don't owe anybody anything, no outstanding bills. Of course, we got a light bill and a gas bill, stuff like that. But we don't have any credit card debt, any other thing that we worked really hard because he said he didn't want me left holding the bag. Now, let me ask you a question. You are more than welcome to leave your... your, your uh, camera on and your mic on because we're going to be interacting how many found that story interesting just wave your hand okay good but that was what we do when we incorporate a story in whatever the speech is there's a whole lot more to go on to this particular story because he's still here and we'll be adding to the story but within six months with the title of my speech when, when I started saying all of the numbers, people were trying to wonder where she's going with it. But then when I said my husband had been diagnosed so all his organs was deteriorating, and I didn't want to leave it on a sad note. I didn't want people to be sad because I wasn't sad. I, now mind you, I did lose it when they first told me. I was hysterical. But when my husband said we wasn't counting days, we been making days count, Hmm. I ain't have time to be upset. I don't have time to be angry or sad or horrified and all those other emotions that I felt at the time. Now it's about giving him the best quality of life. And however often I tell the story, even telling it to my children and not just telling them, but showing them exactly what I mean by making sure that they dad know that I love him and enjoying the time that we have together in a way that we never thought. Some people think six months is a long way off. And some people think six months, short amount of time. But for me and my husband, it was a pivotal point in our life. It was just the right amount of time. Now that's my story I wanted to share with you today. Everybody okay with that? We good? All right. Now, what we're going to do we're going to talk about some things in our story making. I don't care what the topic is, no matter how boring you think other people might see it, because obviously if you gave the speech, you didn't think it was boring. It was exciting to you. It was worth telling to you. So that being the case, why not make it interesting to your audience as well? We're going to include a story. I have a story bag here. In this bag, there's a lot of things. And we're going to work on us telling the story. So we're going to create a story. And I don't see everyone on my screen. Okay, I do see some people on my screen. All right. Let's see. Would Annette. it be, do you want us to be in gallery view? We can do that. Yes, please. 
seen being gathered with you. I don't know if I, I don't know if it's on your end or if it's on mine because I'm on my phone now and not on my well, iPad. right in the phone, you can only see speaker view. You can't see gallery view. But right okay. now, you're on gallery view with the group. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay. In this bag, I have tissue paper, a candle, compact mirror, some hair oil and baby oil, some stickies that I can hang pictures on the wall, hand sanitizer, some stuff for your hair, sewing kit, a business card. Those are the items that was in this bag. And I'm going to add a pair of glasses, scissors, and index card. We're going to begin a story. Now the story is going to be about trees. That is the basis of our speech. We talk about trees. You may talk about whatever type of tree you want to start with. Tell me about an oak tree or whatever it is. An interesting fact about that you know about a tree. It can be real or you can make it up. That's not a problem. The, the subject is us taking whatever our speech topic is and making it a story or including a story in it. Even if I still keep up with all the facts about trees, however many specific trees there are, no matter how tall they are, how short they are, whatever information you want to give, you might want to talk about peaches and how peaches grow and how they develop and what happens inside the tree before the peach comes outside the tree, whatever your speech is, we're going to add a story. And the story is going to keep people interested in what's going on. I might not like peaches, so I don't care nothing about no peach tree. But if I add a story that might interest you and be relatable to you. Now, my story was unique in itself because I was talking about my husband and what the doctor said about his diagnosis. Then I was talking about time, how much time it is. But I added the story of what happened after I got the news, after he got the news, after we got the news. Then it wasn't just about time. Then it wasn't just about his diagnosis. All of those things are true, but there was a story. Now, the first person that I see is, I think is Annette or Annette. That's you. Okay. I can't right now, dear. Okay. We're going to start. you got to start the story by talking about a tree, any tree. And then we're going to use one of these items that I showed. Yes, dear. Okay. I get to start the story about a tree, correct? Is that the, I just want to make sure. Okay, you, you're going to start talking about a tree. And it can be a tree that you're giving us some facts about a tree. But I want a twist to be in there. I want you to be able to tell us the story using one of those items and your tree. Can you do that? Does that make sense? Yes, I can. Okay. Yes. Sitting under an oak tree. I remember growing up about the big oak tree that was in my backyard. It was a beautiful oak tree. Oh, how I wish there was a tree house so that I could sit in the tree house and read my books. Oh, I love to read. Helen Keller mysteries was what I just, oh, could not stop. I'm so glad there were trees because that's how you got books paper. But I wasn't thinking about that. I just wanted to sit inside of my tree house in the big oak tree that was in my backyard. I remember dreaming about lighting my candle 
and reading my Helen Keller mystery book and falling asleep in the tree house that was in the big oak tree that was in my backyard. That was very good. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. We didn't just talk about an oak tree, but her feet could have been about trees. But she took us on a journey, of not just about a tree, but the book she was reading that was made from the tree because it, the book came from paper, which is really, really a phenomenal thing. Okay, so now we're going to go to the next person who I don't know. I can't really, really see names and things. Okay, let's see. Oh, you know what? It'd be easier for me to do this. All right. What about Kelly? I see you. All right. <laughs> All right. Your main topic is the telephone. And we're going to talk about how the phone moves from a telephone to a cell phone. You do remember telephone, right? Yes. Okay. Yes. <laughs> and any one of these items, you got to add to something about the telephone. Now, the telephone is your basic speech. But we want to create a story. So I'm going to give you another element to do with the phone, the telephone rest. Can you review the items in the bag? Yes. Can you review the items in the bag? Got hand sanitizer, a business card, ponytail holders, needle and threads, the sticky things to hold, pictures on wall, baby oil or hair oil, compact mirror, candle, pair of glasses, pair of scissors. Index card, pencil, and tissue paper. Okay. Okay. I do remember what it was like to be on the cell phone or telephone before we had cell phones. Because my family would tell you back when I was a teenager that they were surprised the telephone wasn't permanently attached to my ear because I was a very social, well, still am a very social person. And I would talk on the phone day and night, sometimes fall asleep talking on the phone with my friends. I have one sister who is three years older than me. The only thing we ever thought about was the telephone. And the only time we ever screamed and yelled at each other was over the telephone, because that was in the day where there was one phone number for the whole house and you had to share. I think that what my sister would have enjoyed doing sometimes is taking a pair of scissors and cutting the phone line so that I had to get off of the telephone so she could talk on the phone. And I think part of me thinks it would have been great if we were teenagers when cell phones existed because we would each have had our own phone that we could talk on. But a bigger part of me thinks it's probably better because we, had, we were forced to work through our differences and maybe do some other things with our time than just be on the phone. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much for sharing your story. Now she could have told us who created the phone and giving us all of the data, what year the cell phone came out, and all of that, which would have been fine. But she added the story about her and her sister fighting over the telephone. And yes, I'm the oldest of 11, 10 girls, one boy. I wish I had a pair of scissors. Well, maybe not. I think I would have gotten in trouble if I cut my mother's phone. But nevertheless, we got through that period of our time. And I'm so glad we have cell phones. Now my husband has his phone. I have my phone. We don't have to fight over the phone. Yay. All right. Let's see. I'm going to choose one other person. Okay. All right. Let's see. Jim, how about you? No? Okay. 
Oh, yes, you do want to. Okay. All right. The list is in the chat. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you so very much. And your topic is fireplace. Fireplace. The fireplace. That is the basic story. And tell us a story about any of those items in the fireplace. Well, the fireplace is a place where I first learned that Santa Claus may not have existed. <laughs> and the reason that is, is that when my mom was sitting in front of the fireplace at one time, and she had a needle and thread in her hand, it was an old style fireplace that had been bricked up. And I said, Mom, I don't know how old I was at this time. How does Santa Claus come down that fireplace with all those toys and get into this house when the fireplace has been bricked up for all of these years? Well, to this day, I'm still not quite sure what her answer was, but I think it was that in our case, in our house, he had to come around the front porch and come through the front door where every other child in the neighborhood got to maybe watch for Santa Claus sneaking his way down the fireplace. I had to just sit up in the hallway and wait for that front door to open, which I never did. And if she were not sitting in front of that fireplace, making me think about it while she was using her needle and thread, I may to this day still believe that there is a Santa Claus. Thank you, Madam Toastmaster. <laughs> Oh, wow. Thank you for a wonderful, wonderful story. Thank you so much. Now I'm going to share with you another part of that story that I started early. When I told my husband that I wanted to make love to him every day, and he gave me that smile, like, I'm not talking about like that. When the doctors came back in, my husband asked for a DNR. What you need that for? He said, well, if my organs are deteriorating, my heart is an organ, my brain is an organ, what if they deteriorate and I'm not able to tell you what I want? I don't want to be resuscitated. If I stop breathing, I stop breathing. If my heart stops beating, I want it to stop beating. I don't want you to fibrillate. I don't want you to shock it back so it'll beat again. I don't want to live like that. And you just gave me the greatest hope when you said, you want to make sure that I know I'm loved. Well, that means you're going to give me the best quality of life while I can have it. And because of that, I'm going to sign this do not resuscitate order. Now, the do not resuscitate order is the order that says, the doctor has and put in your chart that says, do not resuscitate. Do not offer assistance if they stop breathing. Just let nature take its course. If the heart stop beating, do not do the thing, clear, <laughs> don't do that. When I went home that night, I wrestled with that. I, I, I couldn't fathom that. I'm trying to figure out, why is that loving me? And I remember sitting straight up in the bed and saying, oh, I should have signed a do not resuscitate order a long time ago. You see, when I was a young girl, I had some tragic things happen, and Alice arose. That's why I'm really particular about be not being called Alice. My name is Alice Ann, but Alice arose. And because of all of those horrible things that happened in my childhood, Alice was very timid, very afraid, would not be seen, don't want, did not want to be seen. Alice dominated my life, even though she was shy, even though she was timid, even though she felt like she wasn't loved, nobody cared anything about her, she wasn't important, but she dominated my life. I didn't take risks. I don't even drive a car because I was so afraid of everything. But the person you see standing before you today or sitting before you today is Alice Ann. I'm out there. I am trying new things. I'm trying to be adventurous. I've been traveling all over the world, especially since the pandemic, everywhere. Joined clubs that was in other cities and other countries simply because I wanted to explore the world. Because I realized if I let the old me die, Alice die, 
I can be Alice Ann. And she doesn't have to whisper in my ear, you can't do that. You're not strong enough. Don't nobody want to hear that. I needed to sign a do not resuscitate order just to let her die. Because it, there was time when she, she was dying. But somebody or something came about and resuscitated her. And she was there again, whispering in my ear, you can't do that. You're not important enough. No one wants to hear what you have to say. And sometimes she would creep back in. And sometimes I became her all over again. Now, there was a twist to that story. It started out talking about what a DNR, do not resuscitate order was. But I'm not just talking about a medical issue. I was talking about something that was dealing with me how I needed to use that to let the old me die. The one that's always afraid, the one that won't take risks, the one, the one that won't step up, the one that would not smile. Like, See, I'm here. I used to think my name meant I don't matter. I was signed Alice Ann, but people didn't see me. I was in a corner, all exclusive, all by myself. I would come into a meeting and just sit back, always behind the scene. That's because Alice was there. But now that I've signed the do not resuscitate order, I mean, I've really had to pull one up on the internet. I printed it and I wrote, do not resuscitate Alice and put it on my wall. So whenever Alice shows up and that part of me that always was afraid, that always was timid, I always felt like she wasn't loved or she didn't matter. I remind myself, I sign a do not resuscitate. So nothing and no one could resuscitate her. I got the order. Now, that's another part of that story. Started off with my husband and ended now with me. But when you start your speeches, when you start your speeches, and whatever the speech is, it doesn't matter if it's a fireplace. It doesn't matter if it's a telephone. It doesn't matter if it's a tree. Whatever your speech is, today, I want you to consider telling a story that people can relate to. Now, you might not have had anyone sign a DNR, but you might have been a person that had some old habits and some old ways of doing things that you don't want to come back up, you don't want to resurface. So that's a whole nother way of relating because everyone loves stories. We hear stories about Santa Claus and we want to keep believing Santa Claus and Tooth Fairy and Easter Bunny. We want to do all of those areas that we, that we want to do, that we want to be related, that we can hear say, I remember being that person that had to struggle with herself or himself. I, I remember saying, I don't want my old habits to come back and I don't want them to dominate my life. Or I can remember when a loved one was sick and we didn't or did sign the do not resuscitate order. Somewhere in your story, if you're telling the story, someone can relate to you and what you said, even if, they didn't know anything about trees, even if they didn't know anything about fireplaces and where fireplaces came from. Now, that could have been your research speech, since we have all of those paths. It could have been me telling the story about my old self dying. It could have been part of my path to deal with emotional intelligence, because I'm recognized that that's part of my life. We have 11 different paths that deal with all kinds of angry, effective coaching motivational strategy, dynamic leadership, leadership development. I'm a leader, but I need to be developed. Whatever your path is and whatever your speeches are about, if you tell a story and you add a story, people will relate because people love stories.
we can use our voice to, oh my goodness, vocal variety, we're moving, people can see us moving, especially if we're standing, they can see more of the screen. Not to be so isolated then. Be animated with your story. Don't be monotone. And the rabbit ran over my feet. The rabbit thought of me as you ran over my feet. Which one would you pay to listen to? Which one? The first one or the second one? Which one would have got your attention? We can do this. We can tell the story because most people like stories. Does anyone have any questions so far? Yes, no, maybe. No question. Okay, let's go with who is this person here? Is it Willie? Is it Willie? Is that your name? All right. You want? <laughs> <laughs> okay, your your main story is the country, and you can use any of those items that's in the chat about the country. Really, we can't hear you. We can't hear you. <laughs> You're muted, Willie. Well, it doesn't show mute. It doesn't show that. What a sneaky way to get out of table topics. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't. <laughs> I'm going to come back to you, Willie. I'm going to come back to you. No, no, no. You still got the country now. All right. Let's see. Who is this? Elaine? Come yes. Up. I'm All here. right. I can hear you. Yay. <laughs> you have small town. I have small town, T O N. Small town. I mean, T O W N. Okay. I once found myself as an overseer to a pastor in a small town inside Lagos, Nigeria. Mm. I could have never imagined that first of all, I would ever travel to Africa. And second of all, that it would be at a time in my life when I was ministering. And this small town inside of Lagos, which has 20 million people in its population, but a jegula, was a very small town community. And I was asked to come and help a minister whose father had passed away and left him responsible for all the village churches around. But that wasn't the most memorable part of that small town experience. The most memorable part was how the people seemed to be oblivious to their poverty. And that may sound funny, but the poverty level was very, very high, so much so that a lot of the children had no clothes on. And they were running around and they were laughing and screaming and playing tag and the little goats and everything that was out there. Little did I know that that was going to be somebody's dinner at some point. They were all out there running together and playing. And it brought me back to thinking about where I came from. At that time, I was living in Geneva, Switzerland. So imagine the contrast of me being there and seeing the difference between our lifestyles. We were worlds apart. But the thing that struck me most was the power of a mirror. 
things that I took for granted that meant absolutely nothing, all of a sudden, this mirror was fascinating. And it made me think about, look in the mirror, take a look, what do you see? And that experience, that small town changed my life forever. It gave me a different perspective on what's really important in life. You see, when I first went there, I tried to think of all the things I could take because I wanted to take gifts. But they gave me the biggest gift. They showed me that it's not about all those things, but it's all about the person in the mirror. Madam Toastmaster. Thank you. Thank you for sharing your story with us. <laughs> now, I, I saw some things in your story. The small town with all of those billions of people. I was trying to figure out. That's small. <laughs> okay. And then your speech could have been about the poverty in Africa. But you gave us a story. You told us that they was oblivious to the poverty level. And you shared with us that these children was running around like they didn't have a care in the world, but they didn't have a care in the world. They didn't know where their next meal was coming from. They didn't know if they were going to have a next meal. But that didn't matter. They was enjoying each other's company, playing around, playing with the ghost. There was going to be somebody to dinner one day. But anyway, did you all hear all of that in her story that she could have been just talking about that small village, that small town, but she could have been talking about the property? We, take, we have taken a major story, I mean, a major topic that was a part of our speech but we added a story which made it interesting. Thank you for sharing that with us. Willie, are you ready? Nope, you're not ready. <laughs> I still can't hear you. All right, let's see. I'm coming back. I'm coming back. Let's see, Regina, you're the next person. And your topic is a best-selling novel. Best-selling. <laughs> um, fellow Toastmasters, the best-selling novel is the one that I'm writing. <laughs> My novel, whenever I finish it, will be a bestseller because it will tell the story of a person who has had numerous types of experiences and the least expected to have thought they would have those types of experiences. It would take me from, it will tell my readers about growing in St. Louis, segregated St. Louis, and then eventually traveling and living throughout the world, including 13 countries in Africa, and many of them around in Europe and traveling and living and visiting India and several countries, a total of 44 some countries and seeing all the types of people. But the thing that have been, that has influenced me the most is the love that I have received from all the peoples of the world where I remember once in Belgium in a village where I walked into, I visited, and a little young girl said, Mama, Mama, Unshin Waz, Unshin Waz. <laughs> a Chinese, a Chinese, because they had never seen any foreigner at all. So there in the small town of We in France, I'm sorry, Belgium, I was a foreigner but the foreigner of Chinese. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and when I'm talking about the other aspects of my story that will be so important because it has lessons that are relatable to people in which they will learn and see themselves. So for that reason, 
I know and I'm confident that whenever I finish, and which will be soon, that my story of Connected, the title of the book is for now, is Connected, An Emotional Journey to Living My African Dream. Wow. Isn't that amazing? Thank you for sharing. Now let's look at her story. She could have been talking about traveling all over the places that she's visited. That could be her book. Or she could have talked about the process and the journey that she is discovering about herself as she writes her book. She could be talking about it's a how-to book to really see yourself and connect with your roots. It could be any of those topics. But what she did was tell us a story especially the story where she realized she was the foreigner because people had not seen any foreigners before. Great job. And thank you for sharing your story with us. And this works out. We're going to deal with just telling our story, putting a story to your speech, whatever your speech is. And what I'm doing today, I'm give you a topic, <coughs> a major topic, and then you use one of these items to twist for telling other story. And Great job, everyone, for doing that. Willie, are you back? Can you hear me now? Yes, we can okay, hear you yes. now. Okay. We in a country. Right. <laughs> okay. Okay. Sorry about that. That's okay. We you here now. So what's my part? You want me to go back to the, what was it, the yes, country? We still have the country. Oh, okay, okay. Hold on a second, please. As, as a military soldier, I've been to a lot of places. And I think the best country I've ever gone to was Germany. I spent five and a half years there. And one of the things that really got me was I went the first time and was there for two years and didn't like it. I mean, I was just miserable. And so 11 months after I re-enlisted to leave there and come back, they, they gave me orders to come back to Germany. And there this time I thought, no, there's have to be a reason for me being here. So I said, I'm not gonna sit around this barracks. I'm not gonna sit on this installation. I'm gonna get out. I took cruises. I took, I mean, everything. I just got on the Rhine River and, and, and uh, cruised the Rhine River. I went to Switzerland. I even learned how to ski. I mean, downhill skiing, in this call, America's Houseburg, it was a wonderful thing. And, and I, I learned how to, I was a little slow about it. And the one thing that really bothered me were the snow snakes. I don't know if you've ever heard of them before or not, but they, you don't really see them because they blend in with the snow. They're kind of dangerous. They, they trip you up. And I kept falling. You don't see them, like I say, but they trip you up and make you fall. And the other thing that bothered me were these little kids. No no ski sticks or anything. And they just line up around there and want to know if you are all right. Get away from me, kid. Get on, beat it. You know? <laughs> but, but I was having fun trying to learn how to ski. And it was downhill. And I did that for, for about a, a, a week. And it was awesome. I mean, a lot of people dream about going to skiing. But I actually didn't have to pay a dime. Well, actually, I take that back. I paid $77. Most people would have to pay, at that time, it was like $500 or something for just one day. And there was no lessons involved. But in mine, I had lessons. I had used to the, to the lodge. I had, I mean, everything for a whole week. And it only cost me $77 out of pocket. And I enjoyed myself. Even the bruises, I was proud of those as well. But it was, it was wonderful. I got to do it. And now I can tell the story that I had to got a chance to do things some people just dream about doing. But not only that, but I went to the smallest country in Europe, Luxembourg. Yes. Now they have an army. Yes. Well, at that time, their military uh, had two tanks. <laughs> it was the thing. That was one of the jokes they had about it, as a matter of fact, because England asked them for help during World War II. And they said, they said well, I can send you half of our tank service. We need the other one for our for our forces, for our protection. So it was like, it was great. I got a chance to meet a lot of people. I learned the language. I can't speak it that well now, but I did. But I made mistakes in it because there was this, this group of women 
they were older ladies and they were in the community that I lived in. And every morning they would get up and walk the thing. So they got to meet me and Stephanie they got to talking and one of them got sick and she went to this, what they call the cure house. And um, so this, this, she, she was a wonderful lady. She was gone for about, I think like three or four months and she came back. And I'm using my German to speak to her because her English was just, just shot. And I said, it says in, uh, is verrückt. Well, verrückt means crazy. But uh, I didn't mean to say that. I meant to say, which is, I see your back. And, and uh, so I had to correct. When I saw the look on her face, I realized I made a mistake and I corrected it. But since then, I've been trying to learn again now because I have a granddaughter that's over there and she does not speak English. So I'm trying to learn German again so that we can talk and hold conversation. But I've enjoyed my trips and, and from now on out, any place I go, I try to learn different things and not look back at the negative, but the positive. And you can get anything out of any place you go, Madam Toastmaster. Thank you, thank you so much. What a great story. It could have been about something none of us, well, I can't say none of us, I just say me. I've never heard of snow snakes. And his speech could have been about snow snakes, snow snakes. And then telling us the story how he got to ski and learn how to ski. It could have been about learning how to ski. It could have been about learning how to speak German and gave us the story in the background story to that. That was told very well. Thank you. It was worth the wait. It was worth the wait. Thank you so much. Now, I, I just want to know, am I making sense of uh, telling a story? I mean, giving our speeches and adding a story. Because the story makes people like, I, I, I see Annette over there laughing and smiling and woo-woo, we, <laughs> we can do all of that. I only called you out because I only see you. <laughs> but it is amazing of the stories that we are coming up with with a base. We have the base speech. And when I'm listening, I'm hearing all of these speeches that can come out of your story that you just told. And... It was funny. You could tell us about the joke of Luxembourg. They only got two cannons. I can't get, I was going to give you one because I got to keep one. That is amazing. Stories that you can tell, speeches that you can give. There are no free speeches. And those of us who can do table topics, and even now in this setting, those are some great speeches. I'm writing a book and it's going to be a bestseller. Absolutely. We can absolutely do that. For the young lady that, that I, I, I apologize, I cannot see the little names on, on the screen. That's why I try to use my other devices because I can see, see it better. But I apologize for not knowing your name. The young lady that said that her book is going to be a bestseller. Absolutely, that can be a speech. I'm writing a book and it's a bestseller. I'm letting you know now, the best kept secret, it's going to be a bestseller. Wonderful job for doing all of that. Let's see, someone else. Let's see, did I, Timothy, are you there? Let's see a screen, yeah, okay. Let's see. Robert, Roberta, I don't know if it's Robert or Roberta. Anderson? Nope, that person's not there. Look at that. All right, Tammy, what about you? Sure, I'll take one. You got a travel mug. A travel mug. Yeah. My parents are big coffee drinkers. I, on the other hand, think coffee is one of the most disgusting things on the face of the earth. Sorry, everybody who are coffee drinkers. <laughs> but my parents, have those their travel mugs they always use a travel mug because they're always with them so even in their house if they're not going anywhere for the day they use a travel mug and they use travel mugs that my mom got from where she used to work and because of this they are identical my mom actually put labels on them so they have their full name labeled on their travel coffee mugs so in their house they know whose it is and if they leave the house and leave them somewhere then somebody can get them back to them but these travel mugs are something that I have really thought about 
or something that I really associate with my parents now because it's, it's become, they don't use coffee mugs, they use travel mugs. And they're always in their hands and I, I can't picture them anymore without having them with them. They drink it all day long. If it gets cold, they put it in the microwave and they heat it back up because they're the plastic mugs so they, they can go straight into the microwave. So they frequently do things like that. I even have a picture of them that I have in a picture frame up on my refrigerator that is just a picture of them kind of waving. And, and in there, my mom actually has her mug in her one hand as she was leaning in to get the picture with my dad. So that, that travel coffee mug is always present and has become extremely tied to my memories of my parents now. Even though I don't like coffee and even though I don't even have a coffee maker in my house, those coffee travel mugs are something that are always present in my life. And I'm Topics Master. Thank you. Thank you so much. Now, I got to see about this coffee mug that's plastic because I don't have any coffee mug that's plastic at all. And I'm with you. I don't like coffee either. I don't even know how to make coffee. So we, don't, we all right with that. But I've never seen a plastic co coffee mug, a, a travel mug. Never seen one of those. That's very interesting. And you can talk about all of that. Those are amazing. And I wanted to thank everyone for jumping in and being a part of our table topic lesson today about including stories or creating stories. The main issue for this workshop is no matter what your speech is about, always include a story. It can be short, it can be long. Your speech actually can be a story. But if you really want to talk about your topic, like all the different, all of the different topics that you have to speak about, your memory of your parents, associating them with coffee mugs. Even, even the short story that you told us that she was trying to get in the picture, still holding the mug, trying to get in the picture. That is the story right there inside of your speech. That's a wonderful job. That is absolutely amazing. How much time do I have left? Do we have time for one more? We have five minutes left. That's probably time for a short one. Okay, let's see. I'm going to let somebody volunteer to do this. The topic is a rose. All right. I'm, I'm sorry, the topic is what, please, Alice? Say, say that again. The a topic roll, is R-O-S-E, a rose. A rose. And which of us is speaking? The two of us volunteered. So. I, I'll oh. yield to Sharon. Sharon, take it away. Okay. What's in a name? A <laughs> rose by any other name would still smell as sweet, Shakespeare declared. I disagree. In all seriousness, you mean a rose, if it were called vinegar, would still smell sweet? <laughs> I love flowers. And the rose, the single stem rose, is a sign of love and friendship. When my mother reached a midlife crisis, I went to a therapist one day and I said, what could I do to cheer up my mother? And he said, buy her a rose. I said, well, oh, that'll die in a few days. That's not very practical. How about a box of stationery? That'll last longer. He said, no, love is not practical. Get her a rose, trust me. And then come back next week for your next session. Let me know how it went. This was, we lived in Hazelwood and Northwest Plaza Shopping Center at the time was the place to go. And there was a lobby in front of a couple of the banks and a flower stand where they sold roses. So I dutifully went to Northwest Plaza and bought a single stem yellow rose and took it home to my mother. The therapist was right. The rose was the right choice instead of the box of stationery. Madam Table Topics Master. Thank you. Thank you so much. I love the opening. That was so amazing. And I was trying to wait and see. Did it work? Did, did, was it worth more than the stationery? Did it make your mom happy? Did it bring her out of her midlife crisis? Wonderful job. You kept me activated and listening. 
interested. Very good job. I want to just applaud each of you for Thank this you. particular segment of our conference. You did a wonderful job and told some great stories. I wish you all the success on your pathway journey. Thank you so much, Allison. This is this was great hearing all those stories. I loved it. I just love that, uh, you know, I hate the pandemic, but I love because of Zoom, we can have people from all over the country come and teach us new and exciting things. <laughs>